Welcome back to Bargaining in War. This lecture is on preemptive war, which asks whether war can start as a consequence of first strike advantages. Throughout the rest of the models we've looked at, we haven't paid too much attention to who is starting a war. If any war is fought, A wins with probability P, B wins with probability 1 minus P, and the sides pay costs. This might not be descriptively accurate, if, for example, I start a war against you, because I'm starting it, I can dictate the time and the place of the first battle. And presumably, I'm going to make choices that are advantageous to my military and disadvantageous to your military. If that's the case, then my probability of winning should be higher than if you were to strike me first, or if we were to both strike each other at the same time. So the task for this lecture is to model that sort of incentive, namely the ability to strike first and the extra likelihood of winning of the war as a consequence, and see whether that incentive can ever dominate the disincentive to fight, namely losing out on those costs. The way that we're going to answer that question is with a two by two game. Pretty simple and straightforward, where state A and state B have two choices. They can either preempt or bargain. We'll have state A playing the rows and state B playing the columns here. You can conceive of preempt as taking advantage of the first strike, whereas bargaining is sitting around waiting for the other side to come to the negotiation table with you so that you can hammer out a solution instead and make peace and not have to suffer the costs of war. We're going to model the payoffs like this. If both choose to preempt, then we're going to assume that the first strike advantages cancel out because they're both fighting at the same time, and so that the payoffs are P minus CA and 1 minus P minus CB, just like normal. If both bargain, we're not going to have a full-fledged round of negotiations that is completely modeled. Instead, we're just going to set some sort of distribution X1 minus X and see if we can find any sort of breakdown that is going to make both parties satisfied and not want to exploit their first strike advantage. To model that first strike advantage, let's first think about the top right corner, where now A is preempting and B is bargaining, so A is exploiting B and gaining advantage through that first strike. The way that we're going to do it is by having A's war payoff be P plus delta A minus CA where delta A is some positive value. So you can think about that as the extra probability that A gets towards its likelihood of winning if it strikes first. So P plus delta A now represents the total probability that A wins. B's payoff is going to also be different. It gets 1 minus P, that part's normal, minus delta A, that part is not normal, minus CB. Why are we subtracting out delta A here? Well, power is a zero-sum affair, so if A is winning more often, B necessarily is losing an additional amount that is exactly equal to A's bonus. So we have plus delta A on one side and minus delta A on the other side. If we do the bottom left corner, now A is sitting around and B is exploiting it by striking first. So A's payoff is going to be P minus delta B, because now B is getting the first strike advantage, this is A's disadvantage, minus its cost of war CA. And for B, we have 1 minus P plus delta B minus CB. And like before, delta B is going to be some positive value. Again, the question that we want to answer is whether we can sustain mutual bargaining. Is there a division x and 1 minus x such that A is perfectly happy to bargain knowing that B is planning to bargain? And likewise, B is perfectly happy to bargain knowing that A is planning on bargaining and knowing that we're going to have this division of x1 minus x ultimately. If you think about what that means though, this question boils down to whether this outcome is a Nash equilibrium. If bargain-bargain is a Nash equilibrium, then we can sustain peace. 
If bargain bargain is not a Nash equilibrium, well, the other three outcomes of this game are war, so we'll have war as a consequence. That will be the outcome of the game. We'll have some sort of fighting, and we'll have an explanation for war. Namely, it's the first strike advantages that are overriding the incentive to negotiate. Okay, well, if we're asking whether this is a Nash equilibrium, that's a simple question. It is asking whether A prefers taking X and not trying to deviate and get that first strike advantage. So for A to not want to deviate, X needs to be at least as large as P plus delta A minus CA. That's only one component of it, though. For it to be a Nash equilibrium, neither one of them has to deviate. So this 1 minus x value better be better than deviating for b and getting 1 minus p plus delta b minus cb instead. So our condition for Nash equilibrium is that both of these things are simultaneously true. If both of these inequalities hold, then both parties are mutually okay with bargaining, and we can sustain peace. If there is no x value that satisfies both of these equations or inequalities simultaneously, then we're in deep trouble. We're getting war. Well, at this point, we know how to go about answering this sort of question. This is the same sort of algorithm that we were exploring in our baseline model of negotiations, when we were simply asking whether there exists an x such that both parties are better off than if they fought a war. Here, all we've done is add some first strike advantages to the mix. So the first step toward manipulating these inequalities is to put it all in terms of x. So let's rewrite this second inequality by canceling out these ones, and then we can't cancel anything else out. So if we just multiply it by a negative one, flip the inequality, we'll have this in terms of x. p minus delta b plus CB. And if we bring this first inequality down, then we'll know when an X is mutually satisfactory. So if we can find X values that simultaneously make both of those inequalities hold, in other words, find an X value that is less than or equal to P minus delta B plus CB, and greater than or equal to p plus delta a minus ca, we're good. To visualize this, all we're asking here is whether p plus delta a minus ca is to the left of p minus delta b plus cb. If so, then we can find any value in here to make x, and both parties will be happy. If, however, this value is to the left of p plus delta a minus ca, then we're in trouble. We can't get a deal to work. Well, to answer that question, all we really need to do is cut out the middleman and check whether p plus delta a minus ca is less than or equal to p minus delta b plus cb. Well, from here, we see that the p's cancel out. And then we're left with CA plus CB greater than or equal to delta A plus delta B. This is the end game of our proof. And you'll notice a similarity to things that we've looked at before. Under normal circumstances, when there is no first strike advantage, we conclude that there exist mutually preferable settlements as long as CA plus CB is greater than or equal to zero. Well, if you set delta A and delta B equal to zero, you're erasing the first strike advantages, and we're left with our original question. Unfortunately, the answer to this question is not as straightforward as it is without the first strike advantages. Depending on those values, that inequality could hold or it might not hold. Specifically, if the sum first strike advantages are larger than the sum costs of war, we cannot find an X value that is going to make the mutual bargaining outcome, a Nash equilibrium. Which means whatever is going to happen is going to result in war. Thus, sufficient first strike advantages, again, delta A, delta B, larger than C, A, C, B, when that is true, we have war occur. The reason that we can't get a deal done is because of this temptation to exploit the first strike advantage. 
War is still costly here. War is still inefficient. But we can't credibly commit to a deal. And hence, this is falling under our umbrella mechanism of commitment problems. If the outcome is war, then we know that we're having payoffs that are going to be having negative value subtracted out. We're going to have CA and CA, CA and CB taken out of those payoffs, which means there are going to exist settlements that both parties prefer to fighting, but we can't arrive at them because if we say that we're going to ultimately settle on any particular point, at least one of the parties is going to say, actually, I would prefer to exploit my other opponent here and fight a war while they're not prepared and get a first strike advantage. Hence, we cannot credibly commit to the more efficient outcome, and hence, this is a commitment problem. That wraps up this lecture. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope to see you next time. Take care.